Child Care Emergency Supply Kits, What to Pack and Where It's At. My name is Holly Nett, and I'm a, the Community Resilience Manager on the Emergency Preparedness Team at Child Care Wear of America. We're glad that you joined us tonight. We're pleased to bring you this webinar in partnership with the National Association for Family Child Care, NAFCC. The Emergency Preparedness Team has posted numerous resources related to preparedness, response, and recovery on our webpage. You can find that information at www.childcareprepare.org. Also on our webpage, you'll find helpful resources and information on how to sign up for our listserv. When you register for the listserv, you'll receive occasional notifications on new resources and events that are happening. Tonight's webinar is the last session in our spring and summer webinar series. We've recorded each session that was held and posted the PowerPoint slides and the handouts for you. You can access these resources on our website, www.childcareprepare.org. A few webinar details for you tonight. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website within one week. Certificates of attendance will be issued by NAFCC and they'll be emailed to you with the email address that you use to register for this webinar. Certificates will not be issued for those accessing the archive recording. All of the participant lines are muted, but you can type a comment or a question into the question box on your screen. We'll allow some time at the completion of the presentation for a question and answer period. If we don't get to all the questions, we'll do our best to try to follow up you with an email response. I want to show you a few things on the navigation panel that's in front of you. On the right hand side, you should see the navigation panel and you can expand or collapse this panel by clicking on the orange arrow at the top. You'll see that we've included two handouts for tonight's session. So you can download these handouts and have them available to you. But we'll also be posting these handouts to our website when the recording is posted. So I'd like to introduce um, our presenters for today. We have Ms. Allison Carlock, who works at FEMA as the National Youth Preparedness Lead on the Individual and Community Preparedness Team. In her role, she's responsible for leading the agency's efforts for engaging youth in preparedness programming, messaging, and initiatives. This includes the Youth Preparedness Technical Assistance Center and the National Youth Preparedness Council. Allison has also led the National Strategy on Youth Preparedness Education and convenes over 60 organizations, schools, and agencies as affirmers in engaging youth and children in emergency preparedness initiatives. During times of disaster, Allison works for FEMA on the National Response Coordination Center, supporting children's needs. She's responded to several large disasters in the field including Superstorm Sandy in New York, New York, and Hurricane Katrina in Biloxi, Mississippi. Allison holds a Master's of Public Policy and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maryland, College Park. She lives in Maryland with her husband and her two daughters. I will be your additional presenter tonight, and I'm Holly Nett, the Community Resilience Manager at Child Care Aware of America. For the past two and a half years, I've worked on Child Care Aware of America's emergency preparedness team, offering assistance to states, child care resource referral agencies, and providers with emergency planning and response and recovery efforts. For over 20 years, I have had experience in the child care resource referral industry, primarily within the states of Minnesota and North Dakota. My educational background is in child development and family science, and I have many years experience working within childcare settings and Head Start. So let's get started. I'm going to toss it over to you, Allison. Great, thank you, Holly. It's very exciting to be with you guys this evening um, as an emergency manager and as a parent myself and daycare user. Um, I know how vitally it, important it is to make sure that 
my family and my children are safe and they know what to do in case of an emergency. Um, and so these are all conversations I've had extensively with my daycare provider. And hopefully tonight we can have some great conversations and make sure that you are prepared, you, your staff, um, and the children at your facilities. So when we think about a disaster or emergency, who is the first person to arrive at the scene? Is it police, fire, EMS? It's actually you as the as the citizen. So when an emergency situation happens, you're going to be the first one, or you may be the first one that arrives until professional help arrives. Relief workers won't be able to reach everyone immediately. It could take hours or days in some situations before someone can get to you. So as daycare providers, it's really vital that you are prepared, not only for yourselves, but also for the children and the families that you work with. They have to know what to do. They have to know how they're going to stay safe, how their children are going to stay safe, um, and, and know this kind of communication information. So FEMA is currently focusing on this very issue right now. Uh, we have a program called You Are the Help Until Help Arrives, and this program teaches five simple steps that help save a life in emergency, and, it, and it's available for free on FEMA's website. Um, so at the end of our presentation today, I've posted a few websites that you can uh, review, and hopefully it'll provide you more information on this and many other programs. So no matter where you are, whether you're at work, you're at home, or even at the library when an emergency occurs, you may need to be self-sufficient um, and, and be the helper until professionals arrive. So it's vitally important that we make sure you guys have the right skill sets, the right supplies, and the right know-how to take care of yourself and others. Thanks, Allie. The other thing that we wanted to point out is that basic, basic services are oftentimes disrupted when an emergency happens. The things that we count on every day, water supply, electricity, sewer, gas, phones, all of those things may be disrupted in the midst of a disaster. And they may be off for hours, days, weeks, or even longer. So think about how you rely on those services. Well, we take those things for granted. How would you care for children in your setting if you had to without electricity or light? How would you manage sanitation procedures without running water or keep the children comfortable without proper heat or air conditioning? When those basic services aren't available or if you have to leave an unsafe space, it's important to have a well-stocked emergency supply kit, which has those items that you need to care for the children in your care. With the correct equipment and materials, you and your staff will be able to handle many of the issues that occur during an emergency. You'll be better able to communicate with emergency management and parents and guardians if you need to get in touch with them. You'll be better prepared to provide first aid. You'll be able to monitor the weather and disaster reports. And a well-stocked emergency supply kit is going to also allow you to feed and care for children during a prolonged shelter in place or a lockdown emergency as well. And as Holly mentioned, depending on the type of disaster, basic services may be disrupted. So meaning your access to things like food and water may be scarce. So it's important that you plan ahead and make sure that you have the right supplies for different situations. And when we think about building our kit, we, we break them down into two main categories. Are we going to evacuate or are we going to shelter in place? In other words, what supplies will we need if we have to go and what supplies will we need if we have to stay? And in situations where we have to leave quickly or evacuate, you want a portable kit you can take with you, something that you can move quickly and easily. Uh, example hazards that may require evacuation could be a flood or fire. And in certain situations, it's best to stay put and shelter in place. In emergencies where there is uh, a chemical spill, it may be best to stay inside to avoid uh, contamination. In shelter-in-place situations, our general rule of thumb is that you'll need enough supplies to support each person for 72 hours. Although many jurisdictions, particularly those in earthquake zones, um, are extending that rule to have enough supplies for several days or even weeks. So it's important to remember that there's no hard and fast rule about evacuating or sheltering in place for hazards. Sometimes you may even have to do both. There could be situations where you may 
shelter in place for a tornado or a hurricane and the, the situation may change, you may have to evacuate. Um, so it's important to watch your local news reports and listen carefully uh, to authorities' instructions about the best course of action. One of the resources that we have created at Child Care Aware of America is an emergency supply kit listing. And that's what you're seeing on your screen right now. I don't expect you to read every detail of it because we've provided the handout for you and the handout's also posted on our website. But I just wanted to show you that we do have it available and how we've structured the handout. So on the left-hand side of the emergency supply kit, you'll see examples of things to include in your kit for the short-term emergencies. Typically those things, if you had to quickly evacuate, really short amount of time, um, we say up to six hours, what would some of those items be um, and what would the use um, be for most of those items? And then on the right-hand side, we include information for your long-term emergency kit. And that, as Allison was saying, could be for a, a situation where it's lasting up to 72 hours. So it is a two-page document. Um, the front page covers important information like water and food needs, clothing and bedding needs, as well as important paperwork. And on the back page, you'll see information on what to include in um, your kit for first aid procedures, sanitation, comfort and safety, and communication. I'm going to show you where you can find this resource on our website if you're not able to download the handout here. If you go to our website, childcareprepare.org, you'll see that there are many um, pictures on the page. The arrow is pointing to a section on our webpage called Tools, Publications, and Resources. That's where you'd want to go and um, click to find this specific resource. And once you click on the Tools, Publications, and Resources page, you'll see on the bottom row of icons here, the third image in, we have an emergency supply kit. So if you click on that, you'll be able to download the PDF. So feel free to um, download that, print it out. If you have a child care center, feel free to print multiple copies for um, all of the different classrooms and for the staff so that they know um, what should be in the kit as well. Okay, so how do you decide what to put in your kit? Just like each child is different, each child care program is unique and it's gonna have different needs. So there are a few things that we wanna consider. What works for you may not work for the child care center down the street. So what are the things that make you unique? Geographically, are you located near a railroad line? Do you know if that line carries hazardous material? Maybe you live in a rural or urban area. Um, how far is the closest hospital to you? How far do the parents commute every day? Um, will they be able to get quickly to you if an emergency happens? I live in Maryland and both my husband and I both work in DC. We have plans in place that if a major event happens in DC um, and she needs to leave the area, we have a designated location set up uh, where she will take my kids and evacuate to. And so these are the kinds of things that we've had to think about and discuss beforehand so that I know in that kind of situation that my kids are safe and accounted for and I'll know the location um, to reunify with her at a, at a later date. So um, Holly, did you say, did you want to say something about different state requirements before we move on? Sure, I just wanted to point out that um, in, in my experience with looking at different requirements in states, some are more specific than others in telling you what you should have in your emergency supply kit. Other states just say that you have to have an emergency supply kit. So we just ask that you look at what your state licensing requirements are, talk to your um, regulatory agency, and ask them what they would recommend to put in the kit. So um, there isn't a standardized kit that every state follows. So um, just check with your licensor. If you work for a corporate child care chain, they might have some recommendations if you're a Head Start program. There might be some guidance that's provided for you. So just know that you might need to dig just a little bit further to see if there are specific requirements that you should be following depending on where you live and what type of program you work in. Great, thank you.
There we go. Um, okay, so when we build our kit, one of the most important things you can do, and probably the cheapest, is gathering your critical documents and your family plans. As a daycare provider, you should have emergency information and plans for every child and family. Like we talked about on the last slide, my daycare mom has emergency plans for each kid in her facility. So if a situation were to occur and she would need to leave or shelter in place, she has all the phone numbers, addresses, and medical forms that she needs to make sure that she can properly care for each child. Um, we talked about evacuating earlier. If you had to evacuate your location, do you have enough vehicles and car seats to safely transport kids? Does each parent know where you will relocate and how to reunify later? Um, you'll want contacts both in and out of town. Local lines may be jammed during an emergency, so having an out of town or out of state contact to check in uh, with will be very helpful. You're also going to want to grab an attendee list if you have to leave suddenly. Um, this will be extremely helpful when you need to account for everyone and make sure that they're safe. Uh, during an emergency or disaster, it's too late to be answering these types of questions. So you want to make sure that you plan ahead, that you have these important documents gathered. You don't want to be going through filing cabinets, trying to pull out uh, parents' phone numbers and addresses and medical information um, in an emergency. So make sure that you have all of this stored properly. You could even have um, backup files stored on the cloud, on a secure cloud, um, or with you in your Go kit. Children have unique nutritional needs that require special emergency planning. Children require more fluids per pound than adults, which should be accommodated by keeping plenty of fluids in your disaster supplies. Creating an emergency water supply for you and the children that you care for is an essential part of emergency planning. So what you'll see here on this graphic is a reminder that you should have one gallon of water per person per day for drinking and sanitation. So think through your current enrollment and the children that you care for and think about ways that you can plan ahead for the water needs. Use bottled water if possible. Bottled water is the safest choice for drinking um, and all other uses. And do your best to make improvements on how much emergency water you have available. Um, for large childcare programs, we realize that this is an awful lot of water to keep on hand and to transport around. But think about what you currently do and try to make improvements on top of that and um, do better than what you're currently doing if you're really not planning for water needs. Observe the expiration date for store-bought water. Um, it does expire and make sure to replace it um, by those expiration dates. You'll also see on the right-hand side of this slide that we talk about the portable go kits and the water supply needs for those shorter term evacuations are different than if you're sheltering in place for 72 hours. Water can be adjusted to one to two gallons for every four children or staff. And really think about maybe buying smaller water bottles um, for greater ease in carrying and transporting um, in those go bags that you have um, when you need to leave your childcare program. You'll also want to think about the food needs in childcare uh, with your emergency kits. You'll likely want non-perishable food so that it can last um, for several months at a time in storage. Think about foods that are high in calories but don't sacrifice too much on nutrition. Um, also think about things that don't require cooking in case you don't have a heat or an electric source. Lightweight items are always good um, when you have to carry the items around in some sort of a um, kit tote of some sort. And then think about the age appropriateness of food too. So on this picture here, um, which was um, given as an example, you might want to rethink things like the trail mix and the peanuts that are listed here if you have young um, toddlers where that could present a choking hazard for them. And think about if any children in your care have allergies too and how to um, include the appropriate food for them to meet their needs. Some of the items that are good for emergency supply kits are breakfast bars, granola bars, 
um, crackers that you know that the children enjoy, dry cereal packs. There's a lot of um, squeeze fruits and portable fruit items that are on the market now, um, little cups of applesauce or chopped um, fruit mixes, fruit snacks, protein bars, pudding cups, and then think about how what you would need to eat those um, items too. So having some plastic utensils, some disposable cups and plates, and if you do have any canned items that don't have the pop-up top, to think about having a non-electric can opener as well. Great, so Holly mentioned uh, some of the, uh, the good food for um, some of our toddlers and our older uh, children that we may be caring for. But we know that for our infants, it's going to be vitally important that we have enough food for them uh, because they have special and unique needs. And in recent history, if you think back to Hurricane Sandy in New York City and Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, there was millions of people that were left without power for several days, weeks, and some for even months. Many were left without water. So how would you be able to properly feed these infants that you care for without these two basic services? Um, you should also be thinking about having extra formula on hand, even for breastfed babies. In the event that mom is not able to return right away, will you have what you need um, as a backup option to feed them? And as Holly mentioned earlier, premixed formula um, or, or water is always the preferred method over powder because it ensures that the water and the bottles are clean. Uh, we want to make sure that in a disaster situation that we Keep things as clean as possible so that premixed formula is going to be important. And you'll also want to make sure that you have uh, extra nipples and bottles on hand um, and possibly ways to clean them. So if you think about your sheltering place needs, you also have to think about your evacuation needs. And so if you needed to evacuate your facility, if you had to leave, do you have a cooler or a way to transport refrigerated or frozen milk? Do you have a way to transport uh, formula supply. So these are some of the um, things we also need to think about in terms of transporting food items for our littlest uh, members. We'll also need to think about extra clothing and blankets. Um, if you aren't able to wash for a few days, it's important that you have extra socks and underwear. Uh, depending on the climate and season that you're in, you may need extra blankets and warm clothing. You're going to want to make sure that you have enough for each of the kids in your facility. Um, if you're going to be leaving the facility um, or even staying in the facility to do some cleanup work, you might want some work gloves. But it's important that you have uh, supplies that are going to match the needs of your facility. So again, thinking back to your geographic locations, are you in a hot climate, a cold climate? Are you in a rural setting? Uh, setting? Um, think back to some of those things and what kind of clothing or bedding uh, would you need that would be appropriate. Okay, so thinking through our first aid items, we all probably have some sort of um, first aid kit. In addition to the typical supplies that we carry for the everyday, you know, spills and cuts and things um, like our band-aids and our alcohol wipes, it's really important to think about medication for uh, not only the children that you're caring for, but also for the staff that are at your facility. So does someone on your staff need insulin? Does one of the kids require an EpiPen? Um, if possible, try to safely store that extra medication um, in your kit. Make sure that it's safe and secure. Um, you want to make sure that it's temperature controlled. Um, so you don't want the medicine to spoil if possible. Um, and you're going to want to check and update your kit quarterly to make sure that the medication hasn't expired. In addition to our first aid supplies, um, we're gonna wanna think about sanitation. Disasters are a messy business and you'll wanna keep things as clean as possible. So you'll wanna consider having extra diapers and wipes on hand. Make sure you have uh, the little doggy bags or poop bags to dispose of dirty diapers. Uh, if you're sheltering in place, you may need to have extra toilet paper and hand sanitizer on hand. Um, cleaning supplies and garbage bags will also go a long way to help you keep things clean. I'm also a big advocate that you should keep some personal cleaning supplies around. A toothbrush and deodorant can go a long way 
when you haven't showered in a few days. Um, and I'm sure everybody on staff will appreciate that. I'll turn it over to you, Holly, for the comfort item. Thanks, Allison. So in addition to the health and safety and the paperwork type of items, it's important to think about the children's needs um, when you have to use an emergency kit as well. It can be scary during the situation when you're either evacuating and you're in a temporary location or if you're sheltering in place in your own childcare program. So thinking about comforting items, comfort items is important too. So small stuffed animals that would provide comfort age-appropriate play activities, things that are lightweight, um, easy to put in a kit, papers, um, pens, crayons to draw on are always um, good things, um, books that would provide um, a comfort to the children, a familiar book, even small containers of um, Play-Doh or squishy balls um, that would help children um, just have some sort of a sensory activity um, during this um, period of time when you're evacuating or sheltering in place are important too. Um, think again about the needs of infants and toddlers too. Um, you may be trying to um, help families out with um, keeping pacifiers away from infants and um, things like that, but it might be important to have comfort items like that in a kit for situations such as this. Also keep in mind that sometimes it's not even things or items that you need in the kit to provide comfort, but it's just the activities that you're doing with the children too. So um, you know your kids best, but what activities would provide comfort to them, such as singing their favorite songs with them, doing simple finger plays with them. Uh, you might even have some um, activities that you use with them to provide um, comfort and soothing, maybe some yoga moves that you do with them. Um, some items that you might want to think about putting in your kit is just a small container of bubbles. Bubbles can be real comforting for kids um, um, to blow bubbles and get some air moving through their lungs. Or having a small bottle of lotion that they can um, use um, can be soothing for kids too. If you have high energy kids, um, think about um, small crank flashlights that you can get put their energy to use and have them crank some of those um, flashlights and be a part of that um, process of providing a tool that's helpful for everybody. When little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join in their chaos. So your reaction to the situation that's going on is really going to go a long way too if you present yourself to the kids in a comforting way and have thought through these things and have appropriate activities and things for them to do, it's going to be very helpful. We've talked briefly now about some of the food supplies that we need to keep on hand, cleaning, some of the comfort items. But there's a few more things that we wanna consider um, and keep in our kits for safety, some other important supplies. Things like uh, flashlights, uh, even glow sticks could be helpful in an emergency if you are without power and without light. You may want to have dust or filter masks. Um, usually in disaster situations, there's a lot of dust and debris in the air. Um, and with little ones, it's important to make sure that they are not breathing all of that into their lungs. Uh, you may need to even have a utility knife or a, a, a multi-tool, um, so something like a Swiss Army knife to make sure that you're able to uh, maybe cut through different types of things. Um, in an, an emergency situation, cash is going to be king. If the power is out, you will most likely not be able to use your credit card um, or go to the bank. And so if you have situations where you may need gas or you may need to buy some food, um, certain places will allow cash. And so it's important that you have um, some cash tucked away um, for that kind of situation. Also, a whistle is a really great thing to keep in your emergency kit. Um, it allows people to locate you. It's a way to communicate uh, when communication lines are down. You also want to think about, again, the climate that you're in. Are you in a sunny environment? Are there lots of bugs and mosquitoes? Um, 
tarps and duct tape can be extremely helpful if you've lost windows or you need to keep out uh, weather elements. You may even want to think about having local maps. If you had to leave the area, um, my husband and I practice this often. In DC, I rely on my phone, my Google Maps, to take me to where I need to go, whether walking or on the metro. Um, and if all that was taken away, I wouldn't know how to get down the street properly without, without those tools. Uh, so we both carry local maps of DC, Virginia, and Maryland in our backpacks. Um, so that if something happened again, uh, such as 9-11 or some other situation, and we had to leave D.C., I would be able to walk out of D.C. and know where I'm going and know where our location meetup point is. So you're going to want to think through some of those situations, both for an evacuation and both for a shelter in place, and make sure that you have some of those critical items that can help keep you, your staff, and your kids safe. And lastly, I know we've touched on this on a couple of slides, um, but communication is going to be key here. And power lines may be down, and so you'll have to think of backup ways to communicate. Portable weather radios are great. Walkie-talkies can also be helpful if you're trying to communicate in close distances. Um, if you plan on using your cell phone, make sure that you have a crank or battery-operated charger. And make sure you know how to use it. I'll share a funny story. Um, I admit that I, in my kit, I recently bought myself a new solar powered radio, cell phone charger, cranker. It had, you know, 10 different gadgets all in one. And we had a storm a few months ago and we lost power for about two and a half days. And I had no idea how to use it. Um, I thought I could just plop it into the sun and it would just work immediately. And I didn't know what I was doing. So make sure that you test all your communication channels and tools um, and plans beforehand because you don't want to wait to communicate in a disaster situation. So one of the things that you'll, you're probably asking yourself is how should you store all of this? Where should you put all of these supplies? So we've put a few pictures up here of some items that might work well for your child care program. What you'll want to do is store your items in a transportable and durable container, and anything that has wheels on them would be very helpful. So even garbage cans with wheels, or they now have portable plastic bins with wheels, those would be a couple of really good examples of how you could um, put your items in a large container if you had to leave with them um, and be able to move them quickly. You'd also want to place them in an easily accessible location. So think about if you have a storage space near your door or your exit. Um, if you are in a child care facility, um, other than family child care, um, and you have multiple floors in your building, um, think about maybe having a, a supply kit on each level of your program. Many of you have evacuation sites in mind or agreements that you've made with a community location. You could actually store some things there, talk to them about pre-storing items there so that you don't have so much to take out of your program. You certainly would wanna have some of the basics, but you would also know that that location has a well-stocked emergency kit for you as well. Another place that you could think about storing your emergency supply kit is in your evacuation vehicle. So if you use a van or a large vehicle to transport children, think about putting the kit in the back of that van and just keeping that well, um, well stocked and readily accessible. Fit what you can in your kits and partner with your evacuation and shelter locations to supplement the storage of needed supplies. Another thing to think about is that kids can help too. Make it an activity for kids to decorate their own supply bags. On the screen, you see some of the small drawstring colored bags. Uh, you can find those just about anywhere right now. But they're cheap. They're a nice way for kids just to decorate and have their own bags. And you can work with parents on um, donating supplies, um, giving them a list of what should be included in that supply bag for the children too. Another thing to consider is if you have staff in your child care program, 
how to assign roles and responsibilities for emergency kits. When you're needing to evacuate or shelter in place, really isn't the time to start thinking through who's going to go get the kit, who's going to ensure that the right materials are inside the kit. So the time to start planning for that is now. Think about how to build it into staff meetings if you have them, orientation process that you have with new staff. Um, you, you know, think through what your supply list would be and whose responsibility it is to check them. Um, you know, if it's every four months, every six months, whatever it is that you designate it, we, we would recommend at least every six months to check those supplies, make sure that the items in your supply kit match the needs of the children that you currently have enrolled. Um, ensure that if you're in a family child care program, that your family members know where your emergency supply kit is and involve them in the process of um, adequately assembling and maintaining that kit as well. So really think through who's going to build the supply kit, who will be doing the maintenance of the kit, and then in the midst of an emergency, whose responsibility is it to grab that kit and make sure that they have it? Because you'll have other responsibilities too of evacuating and making sure that the children are safe during that time. So given it some, some thought and some consideration, um, discussion with staff members that you have or family members or even parents in your program is really important to do. So as Holly mentioned, um, it, it doesn't have to be a big task to build your kit. I know it can be overwhelming and seems like a lot of information, a lot of supplies you would have to gather. There's really um, some, some good ways that you can involve the family members of the daycare facility that you're working at. Ask the parents for help. Have the kids be a part of this. Have them help make personalized bags. The picture that you see here on the screen is actually a good example, I thought, from one child care facility that had all the parents bring in uh, Ziploc bags for their children. Um, so each of the bags represented one day of food for each of their children. And so they had three days of supplies that they brought in. Um, so this can be something that you do on a quarterly basis or maybe on a uh, six-month basis where you ask parents to bring in snacks for their kids. Um, you bring those snacks, you put them in your go bags, then when it's time to transition them out before they expire, you use them for snacks for that week. And then you, you refill your supplies, you restock them um, with fresh new stuff. So it doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be extensive. Um, just start somewhere, start with one or two items and build slowly over time. I wanted to leave you guys with a few additional resources. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different things. We didn't get into a lot of the different programs that are out there um, and resources that really can help you make some decisions about the types of hazards and the type of situations that you may face. FEMA has a ton of great resources that are available. We have um, some really great youth preparedness resources available for free from our website. You can see one right there in the corner, Prepare with Pedro, it's a new coloring book. Um, coloring and activity book that we've designed for kids and it walks them through disaster situations and helps them think through the, the protective actions that they need to take um, in order to stay safe and I know I've used it with my own kids um, to make sure that they know the types of things they need to think about in disasters and it's a great way to sort of bridge those conversations with your young ones in your facility and have them understand um, situations that they could be facing. It's never too young to start talking about disasters. You can do it in a um, non-scary way. And so some of the resources that we have, including Prepare with Pedro, are a great way for you to start having those conversations. Um, we also have a lot of great resources on um, hazards specifically. These uh, fact sheets you'll see at the bottom of the screen there. This one's um, on earthquakes, but it's just a two-pager and it tells you the simple steps and things that you need to think about in an earthquake situation. So if you visit www.ready.gov, you'll see a list of all the hazards on the right-hand side and you'll be able to click through that and find different things that you need to think about. So this will really help inform your, um, your family planning and your communications planning with the folks that are working at your facility. And then I also wanted to add one more resource. We talked earlier about 
uh, you are the help until help arrives. And like like I mentioned, uh, FEMA has a program with resources and training there. So if you're interested in finding out more information about that resource, uh, you can feel free to check out that website. Holly, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Allison. Thanks. At this point, we'd like to see if any of you have questions, and I think a few have come into our um, question box here, so we'll take some time to go through those right now. Um, one of the questions is, how much cash should you have on hand, and are there any grants or funds available to buy items? So. Uh, couple of questions there, Allie, if you want to take a stab at answering either of those. Sure. I think uh, the number, the amount of cash that you have on hand there, unfortunately, isn't a hard and fast rule. Um, it depends on how many you are, how many people you're going to be responsible for. Um, it also may depend on the type of situation that you may face. So is there a large group of people? Is it just you and maybe a handful of children? Um, that's really going to depend on you and what you feel comfortable with. Some things that you may want to just think about in emergency situations that I've faced in the past, it's uh, local commodities like trying to get gas with cash or trying to get food from a grocery store, um, trying to buy water or some other supplies uh, when power was still down. So those are some of the things you might want to think about. How much would uh, a gallon, a tank of gas cost you? Um, if you've got to fill up buses or if you have to fill up vans to um, move your children, uh, how much would it cost to fill up those vans? Um, there's not any federal, federal funding necessarily for um, supply kits, but there are local grants um, that you could look into your local county or state emergency management offices and see what is available. If you also go to, um, during National Preparedness Month, which is the month of September coming up, there are a number of community events. Um, and sometimes you'll see kit building activities. You'll see folks giving away free you know, flashlights or different types of information for preparedness events. So keep a look, uh, look out in your local community to see if there are any events happening in your area in the month of September um, that may be relevant to your kit building. Thank you. Another question that came in is, what supplies do I need for three weeks? I live in an area with a lot of bridges and families work on the opposite side of the river. So how would you make adjustments for a period up to three weeks? Yeah, so that's hard. Um, I think you're not alone. There are a lot of folks in, especially in our uh, Northwest region um, and some of our earthquake zones that have talked about planning for two, three uh, week time frames. And it's difficult. We've heard a lot of folks come and say, well, I don't even have the storage space to hold enough canned goods and water gallons for all the members of my facility. So I'd say that you do the best you can. Um, you also need to know the local resources in your area. So is there a, an adjacent school nearby? Is there some sort of other facility that you could potentially partner with? Um, I think trying to know your resources and the folks that are around you that may be able to come to your aid is also um, just as important as actually having your supplies on hand. So you do the best you can. You try to focus on things that are going to be vital, such as water um, and food. And then you do the best you can with everything else. And then you look to your partners to help you. Um, if somebody down the street knows that there is a child care facility a couple doors down or a couple streets down, you may be the first place on their list that they decide to go check on um, after an emergency situation. So making sure you have those local partners and relationships is really going to be key to help you guys uh, stay successful. <laughs> One other question that came in is related to emergency um, relocation sites. And this particular individual is saying that we were told by our local police department that in the event of an emergency requiring relocation, that they would take this over and that they would decide where to evacuate to. Um, that it's not always a good idea to share a predetermined location um, as it could compromise the safety of the children. 
What do you recommend since this conflicts with what we suggested? Yeah, there are absolutely situations where your police uh, force may be in charge of the situation and may tell you where to evacuate. I would say that you should think about the situations in which your police force may not be able to respond to you. Um, so in a, in a major event, there may be numerous sites around the county or the city or the town that you're in, um, or even the state, and they may, may be overwhelmed. So in those situations uh, where it's not specifically localized to just your, your specific facility or just your specific uh, area, um, where do you think would be best for you to evacuate to? Um, as a, my, a daughter of a high school principal, my mom had plans with uh, neighboring facilities that if they had to take all the students off site, there was a way to walk the students to another facility. So just think about the other facilities within your area. Is that a local business? Um, is that somewhere outside of the town? Think about those different kinds of um, facilities that may be helpful to you. And then have those conversations with the parents. What do they feel comfortable with? What do they think is appropriate? Just make, make sure you're having that open line of communication and then re-engage with your local uh, police group. There are absolutely situations in which they may not reveal that location, which they want to take the children to right away, but you're going to have a lot of uh, very worried parents. So I think it's always best to be able to share that kind of information in most settings. Um, not always, but in most settings, you want to be open about the reunification process. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of very scared parents all trying to inundate one area uh, that may not be safe. One of the questions that came in, um, I will certainly try to answer it. it. says, I'm very interested in the role of resource and referral in emergencies. How should we prepare? Um, are there any resources readily available? Checklists, to-do lists. Um, so yes, um, that's one of the things that we offer um, on our team at Child Care Aware of America is to work with child care resource and referral agencies and help you as an organization first do an assessment of your, your own readiness and how connected are you to the partners in your community? Um, what do you have available that those partners might be interested in, such as data on where childcare programs are, so that if, that if there were an emergency, you'd be able to assist them and help them understand where there may be children that, that need help. So we do have um, information on that for always building additional resources in our toolkit for child care resource and referral agencies. We have trainings that are available. So if you're looking at offering training to child care providers, that's something that we can help you look at and assess too are the resources that you offer to child care programs. So certainly reach out to us. Um, I'll be showing you our email address here in just a couple of minutes. It's preparedness at usa.childcareaware.org. Um, but reach out to us and we'll see if there's a way that we can help you um, look at the resources that you have that you offer to child care programs. Another question that came in, Allie, was related to transporting children. I don't know if you want to give um, some insight on that, but um, this particular child care program does not have um, public transportation nearby and the only um, source of transportation would be staff vehicles which are parked a couple of blocks away. So do you have any ideas of in the event of an evacuation how child care programs could maybe tap into another resource for um, transporting children? Yeah, and this is a great conversation to have, again, with your local um, emergency manager. There was a recent program done between um, Save the Children and Columbia University, and it was called Resilient Children, Resilient Communities, and they took two pilot uh, cities and towns and looked through all of their emergency operations and planning for child care facilities, for um, schools, and looking at all of the unique needs of children. And this is one of the questions that came up. Um, and it was really a back and forth discussion between the local emergency management office and this, um, and, and many of their child care facilities about what would they do for facilities that would not be able to transport children off site. Um, and so again, you're going to be relying on your local partners 
Um, you could ask for donated goods. Uh, we have, I know we've donated um, car seats expire, you know, every few years, but there's oftentimes somebody that's selling car seats for really cheap to have extra car seats on hand. Um, you're going to have to do the best you can with the situation that you're given. But having these conversations now with your local police officers, with your local emergency managers, um, to make sure that you have the right relationships and the right resources that you need um, when that or if that disaster were to happen. So I know that's not the best answer for you, but I think it's really going to come down to those relationships and having that conversation with your local emergency manager to determine what is that best course of action for your specific town. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions that have come in. Um, one question is, should the emergency kit be put together for the whole daycare or for each classroom? What would be your recommendation on that one? I'd say you should have it for each classroom. Um, if you did it for the whole daycare facility, it's probably going to be really large. And having it broken down um, into classroom bases, a lot of schools have um, bags and kits that are broken down by classroom. Even in our office at FEMA, we have kits that are broken down by office. Uh, and there's usually one designated person that knows exactly where the kit is, um, or several people just so that you have backup that know exactly where the kit is, so that if you have to evacuate the room um, or evacuate the building, you know to grab your kit and you're ready to go. Um, I think that's an easier situation so that you have something in every area. Um, especially if you're in a shelter in place situation, there could be a situation where you're going to have to lock down your facility um, or lock down your rooms. And so if you have that kit in your room, uh, you may have some of those resources, some of those th that food and that water, uh, some of the things that you may need until somebody can get you out. Right. And there's somebody making a comment, too, that when you do it for each classroom, you're able to more easily um, match the needs of the children in those classrooms too. So every every classroom has kids with different needs. Maybe one has a medical need that needs to be addressed, or you know, if you have infants, their size of clothing changes frequently too. So you're able to um, make those changes in the kit for that particular classroom. So. Um, definitely think about how to customize it for each classroom. I think there's a lot of advantages of doing that. Another That's question that came in relates to whether or not you should think about practicing drills and talking to families about emergency procedures. So uh, the question is, would it be a good idea to invite families to participate in disaster drills on a weekend or an evening so that in the event of a real one, um, Perhaps the memory of doing that drill with parents might make it less stressful for children. I think that's a very interesting approach. I think as much as you can involve parents in your process and help them understand um, what your procedures are for emergency drills, the better that it is. Um, I think that there's a disconnect sometimes between what you have in your policies and you probably think that parents are reading those policies thoroughly and what they actually do read and um, retain as far as what you will be doing for emergencies. So I think having a parent event is a great idea. Um, maybe having them walk through a drill helps them um, troubleshoot with you too. Help them give some feedback on what went well and what didn't go so well. I think that's an excellent idea to involve families and a nice way to give them a refresher on what your policies and procedures, where, where your evacuation location will be. Um, that might be a good um, time to solicit donations too for your emergency supply kit. So making it into a parent event is a wonderful idea. So thank you for sharing that. And Holly, I would just like to add one story. Um, this was back from Hurricane Katrina, but the last child to be reunified with their family from Hurricane Katrina took seven months. Um, and so you always think in a disaster situation that you're going to be able to communicate, you'll be able to pick up the phone, you'll know where that person is. Um, but if a flood were to come through and you had to evacuate and one person is going in one direction and another person is being taken in a different direction, you have to have these conversations ahead of time. You have to know 
What is your backup plan? How are you going to communicate? Is there an out-of-town contact that you can check in with so that everybody knows that everyone's safe and you can relay information? Um, you don't want to wait until an emergency happens to figure out how to communicate with the parents for them to figure out and to locate their children. Um, so it's vital that you have this information. I think it's brilliant that you want to involve the parents and get them talking about the situation. It's so important that every person plays their role um, in this situation and knows what to do. So thank you for that comment. Thank you everybody who asked questions. Um, if you didn't get your question answered and you're seeking an answer, um, feel free to email us. We will certainly follow up with you. We'll take a look at the questions that came in too. And um, if there's a really important one there that we just didn't have time to get to tonight, we'll try to follow up with you. So just some reminders as we wrap up tonight, um, a recording for this webinar will be posted at childcareprepare.org within a week. And we'll also give you access to the presentation slides and the handouts that were used in tonight's session. And certificates of attendance will be issued by NEFCC and they'll be emailed to you within two weeks to the email address that you use to register for this webinar. One note um, that I'd like to make is that sometimes those certificates um, end up in your spam or your junk folder. So if you're a week or two has gone by and you haven't received your certificate yet, take a look there and just um, see if it maybe landed there instead of in your inbox. Um, and if you have any problems at all, um, certainly let us know and we will follow up with you on that. Also another reminder that the webinar series that we held this spring and summer, um, all of those are archived. You can find those on our website as well. So on the screen right now, you can see what topics um, we held throughout May, June, and July, in addition to tonight. So please check them out. There's a lot of helpful resources there. If there's a topic that you are um, really wanting more information on and you think it would work well in a webinar format, um, please give us that feedback too. We're always open to hearing what it is that you want more information on. The email address that you can use to contact our team is preparedness at usa.childcareaware.org. And once again, um, here is our web page as well, where you can find a lot of great resources and information. But we just want to thank all of you for your participation tonight. I want to thank Allison for her help and um, the partnership that we have with FEMA. And we hope that this was helpful for all of you. So we appreciate any feedback that you can give us and hope that all of you have a nice evening. Thank you for your time tonight.